Thank you very much, John. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome once again to another in our series of reflections. I want to get uh, begin today by telling a story that was told by uh, Dr. Billy Graham. I hope uh, my good friend Dr. Craddock will forgive me. I'm not quite the storyteller he is. As you know, he is a legendary storyteller, and particularly with Appalachian tales. But Dr. Graham tells the story of an old mountaineer who lived in a holler in the Appalachian Mountains, not far from here. And his only companion was an old humpback mule that kept, kept him company during his idleness and his hours of loneliness. And he loved that mule so much. One day, he announced that he was going to enter it in the Kentucky Derby. Well, you can imagine what his friends thought. They thought that he had finally gone crazy or that he forgot to take his medication. But in any event, one said, why, Uncle Ned, that mule doesn't stand a chance to win the Kentucky Derby. That race is held only for the <coughs> world's finest thoroughbred. They come from Italy, Paris, and even Arkansas. <laughs> The old man said, well, he said, I know that. I know he can't win, but look at the distinguished company he'd be keeping. <laughs> so I'm very delighted to be in such distinguished company today uh, to have them discuss a subject that is growing in, in America, and that is the relationship between politics and religion. And we're happy to have today with us uh, Dr. Fred Kraft, who is a minister emeritus of the Cherry Log Christian Church, Cherry Log member over here. Dr. Craddock was selected as one of the nation's top preachers by Newsweek magazine. He serves as director of the Craddock Center, which is a nonprofit organization that works to meet the physical, social, and cultural needs of the communities in the Southern Appalachian Mountains. I've had the experience of working on a project with Dr. Craddock, and he's, he certainly has my admiration and respect for the work that he does. He's author of several books, some are here. Uh, they're all well known and uh, well read, and we're delighted to have him with us today. Also with us is Dr. Charles Gillespie, pastor of the Providence Methodist Church in Grand Blairsville. Uh, Dr. Gillespie has uh, started out life as an aeronautical engineer, has a, uh, a master's degree in industrial psychology. And somewhere along the line, he received the call for the ministry. So he went down to Emory University and got uh, two degrees, got an MS in divinity, cum laude, and he also got his doctor in ministry. And as I said, he's the pastor of the Providence Methodist Church, and I'm glad to see some visitors here from Providence here today. Uh, also, we have uh, uh, Dr. Jim Hale, who is uh, a retired professor from Young Harris College. Dr. Hale grew up in Florida. He has a bachelor's degree from Emory University. He has a master's degree from uh, Emory. He's uh, taught here at John Harris College uh, for quite a while, and he is uh, also a professor, uh, teacher with ICA. We're also delighted to have uh, with us today Dr. David Franklin, who is uh, a longtime professor at John Harris College. He uh, has quite a reputation as a teacher told his students love him, and uh, he does a wonderful job of helping these young children through their career here at Grand Harris College. I once said uh, that, uh, I guess I could say I brag, uh, that if you gave me a holy Bible, a copy of the United States Constitution, a good book of poetry, and a Bob Dylan album, I could write you a humdinger 
of a political speech. <laughs> but I'm afraid that's not possible anymore. It seems that biblical quotes are sure to offend someone. The Constitution has been interpreted so many times you, you can't keep up with it. Few voters nowadays read poetry. And I'm afraid Bob Dylan's philosophy has been replaced by a more religious, conservative electorate. That's what we want to talk about today. Uh, when the Coke Bill came to America in 1831, he found people with a widespread political enthusiasm and religious enthusiasm. He wrote in his famous dissertation that a distinctive American characteristic was the bond between our people caused by righteousness and <coughs> proclaimed from our pulpits. He went on to say that he never encountered the people whose everyday cultural experience was so religious. Yet today, we find ourselves at odds with our religious heritage. Issues that once were Sunday morning sermons are now commonplace in government, in such places as state legislatures, the courts, even the White House. So now I want to turn to this distinguished panel ask this question. Does religion have a place in politics? Dr. Crabbe. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I might approach it this way. Can you hear me? Uh, yep. If you can, and prefer not to, you can trade with somebody in the back. <laughs> I think I'll approach it historically. That religion has always had a place in politics. Uh, whether we like it or not, they are inseparable. How to negotiate that, be fair about it, honest about it, is difficult. My own uh, field of work uh, through the years has been the teaching of the New Testament. In the New Testament, in the Christian Bible, uh, there was tension with the Roman government, but the advice to the churches was, honor the king, pay your taxes, uh, do not uh, be troublesome in the empire. The only thing, that, and you find that in Romans, 1 Peter, and other places, but the only thing they had difficulty with was treating the emperor as divine. Emperor as emperor they understood. Emperor as divine they did not understand because the Christians said Jesus is Lord. The empire at times, not always, but at times, insisted that Caesar is Lord. And that moved from politics over into religion. And the church uh, had difficulty with it and it brought about some persecution uh, up until the year 313. And there was a total reversal in the relationship of Christianity at least, that one religion, and the empire, a reversal of positions because beginning in the year 390 under Emperor Theodosius, Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire. And in some places, it was against the law not to be Christian. The, uh, Soldiers were sent out, you know, to baptize people in mass, <coughs> just to make sure we got all this straight. And so the church developed a kind of dependence upon politics or upon government to pay the salaries, build the buildings, maintain the buildings. It was a relationship referred to as Christendom. And the era was talked about Constantine, the Constantine era of Christendom. And that relationship developed so that uh, the law supported and enforced what was taught by the churches. And uh, there was good and bad in that. There was so much corruption and wars and hostility uh, as that developed. When, when our forebears came to this country, they brought with them a long tradition of Christendom and a dependence upon the state to reinforce what the church taught. Now, I'm not 
blaming them. That's all they ever knew. And so while we say in general, they came to this country <coughs> to escape religious intolerance. Many of them came over here to establish it in a strong and pure and clean form. And therefore there were colonists in which the state enforced keeping the Sabbath. Sabbath breaking was against the law. Public uh, obscenities, vulgarities, bad speech enforced by the state. Incessments of money from families to support the church was in this country. It was brought over from a, from a tradition called Christendom. And remember that this country had an uneven history of relationship to that for 150 years before we had a, had a, had a Declaration of Independence or a Constitution. And some things were set deeply in the American mind and heart. It's just uh, painful to me to read some of the colonists where you had to belong to the church to run for office. You had to belong to the church to do this and that. It was there. I like dreamily to talk about they all came over here to separate church and state. <laughs> Not on your life. <laughs> and, but it's an uneven story. We can get into it later, but I... I think in the time of the Constitution, well, the Declaration of Independence has three or four references to God, nature's God, majesty, divine power, ruler of the universe, things like that. It's interesting that by 1776, 1787, those years, the efforts to put the name of Jesus Christ into official documents was resisted. They had had enough of that. And therefore, I think I would say, this is, I guess, just an introductory statement, but I think I would say that the efforts to include Jesus Christ in the official documents in those early days shows the desire to separate church and state. And in the Constitution, you know the wording of no establishment of religion, no prohibition of the free exercise of religion. Those two things are what's interpreted uh, so many ways. Uh, I haven't gotten good instructions from Bob as to how long to talk. So I think I'll see where it's picked up and I'll know then where to put my oar in. But some of these things I have some knowledge of and some of them I have a lot of passion about. If that shows up, I, well, I make no apologies. <laughs> So I'll pass to someone else. Thank you, Dr. Craig. Yeah. That same question. I certainly think that um, religion has a place in politics. Uh, just as any other lobbying group up in Washington, D.C. has a place in politics. Um, I think a Christian, a Muslim, a Jew, Whatever he is or she is, has every right to try and influence his or her government. But I'd like to pick up where Dr. Craddock left off. And it was not only with the removal of Jesus' name, but when our Constitution was written, our founding fathers were so aware of the religious intolerance which had taken place back in the 16th and 17th century. Even the religious intolerance that took place in Puritanical New England. And there are many references to that that we could talk about. But our founding fathers were intent upon writing a God-less Constitution. It's amazing the number of students that I encounter in the classroom who are unaware of our God bless Constitution. 
And uh, it was no accident. It's not like you go to Thanksgiving dinner and you know you start eating because the food's so great. You halfway through, uh oh, someone forgot to say grace. Let's pray. No. The religious right at the time was led by Patrick Henry. And he didn't get it his way. Because he would love to have seen a godly constitution. But what we came up with was a godless constitution. And um, it was very much a product of the age of the Enlightenment that was very, very skeptical toward religion, and particularly skeptical toward the Roman Catholic Church. And um, one of the most uh, vocal philosophers of the period is Denis Diderot, who once said, and with the guts of the last priest, let us strangle the last king. It was rhetoric like that that played a very important role in the minds of our founding fathers. And um, there have been efforts throughout history to get God's sacred name into the Constitution, which have failed. And basically, uh, what they've done is maybe gotten his name on something that I prefer to consider to be blasphemous because you cannot worship both God and money. But we do have in God we trust on money. And I hope people can understand maybe where I'm coming from, and I think that's rather blasphemous. Um, and then, of course, in the height of the Cold War, uh, <coughs> President Eisenhower, um, you know, came up with, with the motto, in God we trust. And it was the persistence of the Roman Catholic Church's Knight of Columbus to make sure that the Pledge of Allegiance to the United States of America included the two words, under God. That was a concerted Roman Catholic effort. And I suspect the Roman Catholics of the 1950s that succeeded in getting under God into the Pledge of Allegiance of the United States of America uh, would be very pleased with the Roman majority on our judicial tyranny, whether a Democrat or a Republican. I guess the civil term is to call it our Supreme Court. <laughs> but I think probably many of our founding fathers would be flipping over in their graves if they knew that a majority justices on the Supreme Court were Roman Catholic. Because so much of this country of ours came about in reaction to the excesses of not only the Roman Catholic Church, but the excesses in the Protestant community as well. And I'd just like to close by saying this, and maybe we can come back later. Uh, the European Union a few years ago was toying with whether or not uh, it would go with its own heritage and come up with a godly constitution? Or would the European Union follow in the footsteps of its most famous child, the United States of America, and come up with a godless constitution? As you can imagine, with the dismay of the Vatican and the jubilation of Jacques Chirac, the European Union <coughs> followed our example and came up with their own godless constitution. So that's all I can say. I, I failed to, uh, to tell you that if you have any questions during these presentations. So please raise your hand and be recognized. I prefer to do it that way and address the question uh, to me to keep everybody from asking questions at once. Yes, ma'am. Uh, just a point of clarification. Um, 
when you say God less, why do you say that? Is it God's name is not mentioned in God's the text of the Constitution. It was deliberately avoided. What is his name? <laughs> well, you may call him Allah, Yahweh, Yahweh the Great I Am. Doctor, hey, while we're on the subject, I should have kept quiet. <laughs> Did you hear me, Doctor Taylor? Yes, sir. While we're on the subject of the First Amendment, I think we all understand that its purpose was to guarantee two things. First of all, that Congress will not favor and promote or endow religion. And that Congress uh, shall not impede, obstruct, conduct or penalized religion. In other words, government, according to the First Amendment, would simply leave religion alone. Now, you are a noted historian. So I have a question for you. A recent survey conducted by the Pew Research Center revealed that amazingly 85% of Americans polled characterize the United States as a Christian nation. Is ours truly a Christian nation? <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> I refuse to answer that. <laughs> Amen. Would you say it again? <laughs> is, is our nation what? It, is our nation truly, truly a Christian a true nation? At the time, or shortly thereafter, um, the Constitution was adopted 1789, we had our first census, which revealed that there were 1,234 Jews in America and slightly under 10,000 Roman Catholics. The rest either didn't care or they were members of some uh, Christian or Christian peripheral group. Uh, <clears throat> all but four, I believe, I may be wrong there, but I believe that all but four men who signed were affiliated with some denomination, Quaker, Methodist, there was even a couple of Methodists there, and they were just getting started. Um, they've gone a long way, they've got a president and vice president. <laughs> anyway, um, at that time it was, population-wise, it was predominantly Christian in nature, but not necessarily um, in, uh, in its makeup, excuse me. I do not agree with David, though, completely on this Godless. Um, I, uh, I see the name of God uh, in our constitution, well, the name or a term, I prefer the term rather than name. A.D. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I picked up, uh, and I went to the internet this afternoon, or early this afternoon, just curious, and uh, I only had time to go through uh, the first 23 randomly selected state constitutions, and then the preamble or the religious establishment clause in each one of them, uh, Heavenly Father, uh, our omniscient God, our omnipotent God, uh, there is reference to God in every one of the state constitutions. I believe possibly that at the time of, of the constitution that this was one of the matters that was going to uh, designed or envisioned as being a concern of the local government, not the federal government. They had been abused and they had been taken advantage of by uh, national governments uh, where religion and uh, well, politics or government were <coughs> united. But uh, I disagree strongly and I could probably, though I've got to kind of mention, noted there all sorts of comments about uh, that, that would be indicate that it was not a godless nation. By the way, to illustrate that, the ministers of uh, the salaries of congregational ministers were paid by the state of Massachusetts up until 1842. And the United States government paid, paid the uh, salaries of uh, Mennonite brethren and Catholic missionaries in the Northwest Territory. And so there was not a complete wall there at all. 
I didn't say a no, I, godless I, nation. I said a godless constitution. I federal constitution. Yeah. I wasn't talking about state constitution. Bob, well, would you kindly define what you mean by a Christian nation? Because there is a great gap of people yesterday and today who don't embrace any faith. Uh, they are, I don't know what you want to call them, but they are not churchgoers. They are not believers. They may not be unbelievers, but kindly define your own ter your own term, please. Well, I wish I could. <laughs> you, just, you, just, you brought it up. Uh, you, you just asked the question for me. Uh, I would like to know the definition of a Christian nation. That's what I'm trying to elicit here today. I will be fearful for our future if we come up with a good definition. That will satisfy us all. There's a, there's a new term that I've heard uh, related to what Spencer was talking about, and that's secular humanism. In other words, you can have feeling and be good and do good things and love people without being a particular member or a Christian or a Jew or whatever. So maybe that's the great gap. Was Franklin one of those? Was he a Christian? No, was he? All right, to define, to take Betsy's uh, definition and run with it for a couple of steps. Ben Franklin, we all know, was a theist. Right. But was he a Christian? I don't know. Red, you probably know. No, he was not a Christian. Uh, Benjamin Franklin was not. Thomas Jefferson was a deist. At one time, Jefferson said, I'm a true Christian, but he was doing it in his polemic against priests, ministers, organized religion that he felt was full of hypocrisy, and he claimed for himself to be a true Christian, but he didn't elaborate on that. Uh, no, I, I, I think so. I, the Senate approved a treaty with Muslims in North Africa in uh, 1797, something like that, which states the United States in no sense is founded upon the Christian religion. Treaty of Tripoli. Treaty of Tripoli. Yeah. The government of the United States of America is not in any sense founded on the Christian religion, signed by President John Adams. So it's been easy in our development as a nation to ease from belief in God to just assuming then that the people are Christian. Mm. And that's not the case, and they don't like for us to make that uh, slip. Uh, I think the belief in God, supreme power, creator, that sort of thing, was very common among all hundred or so of those involved in the founding of the Constitution and all that. But not Christian in the sense of organized religion that had some specific and central role for Jesus Christ. Uh, if I may, I think that's true today. Uh, stories told about the census taker asking a group of people, uh, are you Christian? And they said, well, I'm not a Jew. <laughs> uh, you see, you were either one or the other. It, it wasn't so much what you believed about Christ or how that would involve your own personal life. It's just in this country, you either were Christian or Jew as far as they were concerned. I, I think uh, coming back to this other, if I may just a minute, I think God's name is not in the Constitution, uh, as we might like to see it, I suppose, because the people at that time came out of a background, and it always helps to know the situation in which something happens, out of a background in which they were scared to death if the government had anything to do with religion. They just did not want that again. They'd gone, well, put it back to Henry VIII, but Catholic one day, Protestant next day burned in the state now. You were thrown into prison now, beheaded now. And even the king wasn't sure of his, what he was believing at the time. And so they come over here and write a constitution. Don't you put God in that thing. The government will have nothing to do with God. God is our concern. God is our faith. And we want to the constitution. It's only the people. Sense, it's God. Yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, the one to make no mistake about it. Rousseau. That's right. We, the people, 
Unlike the Declaration of Independence, which begins with Jefferson's reference to nature's God or whatever, um, the United States Constitution is we the people. God is exiles. We will make no laws concerning our religion. None. Doesn't that go back to, to uh, the determinism of religious doctrine in Europe? Determinism was an instrument that was very convenient or to support the divine right of kings. I mean, some people are, are ordained by God to rule, and others are left to serve the rulers. It's all set out in a deterministic form. And the Enlightenment was reacting to determinism, wasn't it? And it didn't say there is no God. It just said the state shall not determine who you believe in. You have to make that decision yourself. And what freed us from the determinism of Europe that led to all those horrible wars between so-called Christian peoples was a freedom from determinism. The reason we've gotten along so well thus far until this current age of theocracy is because we believe in the freedom of religion. Amen. Every person can choose that government cannot impose religion. Amen. And today we seem to have forgotten that. Somehow we, we want to hunger back for the determinism that puts everybody in their place. And that's not what our country is about, and that's not what the Christian faith is about. Amen. Not all of us have forgotten. <laughs> not all of us have forgotten. Forgotten what? Forgotten what? What, he, what he just said. That we are, what we were not going to... Uh, Make laws about religion, right? Other, religion. Only certain people. Other questions? All right, talk to my students. I think you and I have talked about this before. People who go to church and absorb lessons there and make their real life decisions based on what they learn. Isn't that a good announcement? That picture will be Okay. Uh, I read a poll the other day that found that 11% of U.S. churchgoers were urged by their by their clergy to vote uh, to vote a particular way in the 2004 election. That was up 6% over 2000. 51% of those polls said churches should express their views on political matters. Should ministers endorse candidates or parties on the polls? No. no. Amen. Why? Amen. Why not? Uh, I, I think it's proper for the, the minister um, to stand for certain <coughs> moral things, if you will. But not to go into candidates, that kind of thing. Um, you have to give that freedom to the pulpit. Uh, it, it is a part of Christianity to be against slavery. And to tell me I can't tell you you who are against slavery, I think is, is ridiculous. It emasculates Christianity. There are things we believe in. And I, as your pastor, am going to tell you, you be sure that you stand for that. Now, if you can vote for him or vote for him, that's your problem. But the moral issue involved is this, whatever it may be. And that, as a Christian, is your job to support. That's my belief. Well, thank you. And there's certainly no unanimity of opinion among Christians. That's right. Uh, we have... <coughs> A pope and a former president of the United States, who is a Baptist, who both condemned this current war in Iraq as being an unjust war. Um, at the same time, this pope who calls the war in Iraq unjust is very much opposed to abortion. Now what are you going to do? Are you going to follow the line of the unjust war? 
Are you going to be totally in agreement with him and support his view on abortion too? Or are you going to, go to make up your own mind about some minister having to tell you? Just as employers told their laborers in the 1896 presidential election when William Jennings Bryan, the great populist, was running against the conservative main <coughs> candidate, William McKinley. Workers, if you vote for William Jennings Bryan, you will lose your job. And these workers said, yes, sir, factory owner. And of course, they voted McKinley into office. <laughs> so, I mean, there, there's so many people out there that really cannot <coughs> think for themselves. Uh, and they have to be told how to vote. And uh, I think it's very dangerous, especially when a minister uh, begins to tell his flock how to vote, especially in a free society. Then how do you forgive a Pat Robertson who was, Robertson who was in our national enclave of a government and others of his ilk who are telling people what to do and how to do it? Well, if I'm not understanding you. Uh, you're saying that I cannot tell my people to be against slavery. I think that's fine. Okay. Although the Bible, let me say something more about the we Bible. We've got slavery in the Bible, sure. Yeah, and, and never did the Bible come out and condemn it. The closest thing was Paul's letter to Philemon, in which he urged the master to be good to his slave. And unfortunately, uh, slave masters in the South used both the Old Testament and the New Testament to defend the institution of slavery on biblical grounds. I think it's been said you could find something in the Bible to defend anything you know. Right. <laughs> but it was, and, and hence the churches, all the, the, the Bible Belt churches split. The Presbyterians, the Methodists, and the Baptists all split. The Episcopalians and the Roman Catholics did not. But the big three mainline Protestant denominations did split over the issue of slavery. Uh, if I may, we were going to take a short break. And I know you get scrunched here, but we had a question that was unanswered. Well, my question was uh, I think the Reverend points out that he doesn't have the the latitude or the responsibility or the right to tell people what they, who the, whom they should vote for. Yes. And yet, on our national politi political scene, hobnobbing with George W. and the like, are, are people like Pat Robertson are telling you how you should vote, uh, telling you to form your own conscience in line with what they think and go and vote the way they want you to. Mm -hmm. and, and how is that to be forgiven by our slave people? How is that to be? I think one point that might be helpful to us all if we would uh, run into it. One of the best books I've run into in recent years is this one called Original Meanings by a man named Rocco Bay, or I, I guess that's what he pronounced it. But Politics and Ideas in the Making of the Constitution. And he takes not only the times, but the phrases that are used in the Constitution and tries to explain them in their 1787, 1789 meaning. And one of the problems many of us have today is that we have certain terms, certain phrases, and we're reading back into. That's from both the conservative as well as the liberal. <coughs> Amen. I think that's an excellent point. And I would, anyone that's interested in this, uh, you look at the book and you get the publisher if you're interested. It's, it's an excellent book. Say the name again. Original Meanings. Uh -huh. And uh, one of the six ways the Supreme Court supposedly uh, uh, analyzes uh, these types of issues that come before them is from the perspective of a, a, a view that they call originalism. And what was the original meaning? And then there are five, other, five, five six other ways 
that supposedly is the way they are posted <coughs> their decisions. I guess this information was smuggled out by a clerk. <laughs> uh, I think what we have seen today is an evolution in politics <coughs> apart from the basis that these gentlemen have been talking about. And politics has evolved into what is a science and an art. Religion, Christianity being one of them, is a spiritual attitude. And I think that there is room for a spiritual attitude in this science and art world of politics. But if you go to extremes, you become labeled as zealous, moral majority, and you askew the intent of the Christian community. So my question, I guess, is, cannot our politicians also have a spiritual attitude in their business? You're asking me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, would a spiritual politicians, attitude Politicians with normally like to have behind Bible, religious philosophy. You, you, you hear it from, you, you, you not only hear it from George Bush, you hear it from almost every politician. Because is that that's, wrong? Is it wrong? I think that uh, that's a decision the politicians make. If he feels more, or she feels more comfortable mm -hmm. in that posture, then, then it's fine to do it. If they're uncomfortable with it, <coughs> they don't believe it, then they shouldn't do it. But I think you'll find that, uh, as I said, uh, the Holy Bible, the United States Constitution, poetry, Bob Dylan, make a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful political <laughs> We're looking forward to that. <laughs> Any other questions? We're going to take a short break. Let me just close with one little thought. I, I gave a talk years and years and years ago on freedom. And after I had given it, one little lady came up to me and she said, that's the finest talk I've ever heard, and if people don't listen to it, we won't make them. <laughs> 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 was the founder of a social justice ministry called the so Sojourn. wrote a book entitled God's Politics, Why the Right Gets It Wrong, and the left doesn't get it. They criticize the conservatives for defining moral values in terms of homosexuality and abortion to the detriment of concerns over poverty, the environment, criminal justice, and war. And he criticizes the left for elitism that alienates many people. If you agree with Reverend Wallace, do you think we as a nation can ever connect the hunger for spirituality with the passion for social change? Well, I, I think we certainly should. Um, um, I was at one time a member of a political party because I was a Christian. And I thought the political party that I was a member of, it, by the way, I was a member of it until a month ago, I just got tired of the leadership of the hypocrisy, particularly going up there in Connecticut with Joseph Loser and Hillary Clinton. Um, so I got out of the party uh, formally. Uh, but there for a long period of time, uh, I was a Democrat because I was uh, a Christian first. And uh, I just happened to believe at the time that particularly the Democrat Party uh, address these social issues, these issues of compassion, much more effectively did, than did, you know, the opposition party, which was all into free enterprise, capitalism, and that sort of thing. Um, but uh, I, 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 would, I would certainly hope that, that these people could come together. Um, uh, <coughs> as Paul said, in Jesus Christ there is neither male nor female, Gentile nor Jew, master nor slave. And I think it's, it's very sad how, 
how the bickering between political parties today, and it's just merely bickering. I mean, it, it's been said that the duty of the opposition is to oppose, but there are so very few differences between these two political parties that would like to constantly go around badgering each other. Um, and surely there's got to be some kind of common ground uh, of compassion. Uh, and, and for me, it came as a Christian growing up in Birmingham, Alabama during the Civil Rights Movement. I was the very same age as those little girls who were killed in the church bombing. Same age as Condoleezza Rice. And, uh, you know, I can certainly understand why she is a Republican coming up from Birmingham, Alabama in, uh, in uh, that time. Because what you had were all these so-called Dixiecrats like George Wallace running around, John Patterson, um, that were just a real, I think, as a kid, a personal embarrassment to my faith as a Christian. And uh, as I've already told you, I think, domestically speaking, um, not in foreign policy, but domestically speaking, uh, one of my greatest heroes is Lyndon Johnson and the compassion that he showed, particularly for the elderly, uh, the compassion that he showed for the environment, the compassion that he sh showed for housing and things of this nature. And I know he's not a very popular president, particularly in this region of the country. And people in Birmingham hated Lyndon Johnson with a passion because he was forcing African Americans. Yes. And, and as a student in elementary and high school, we didn't have public prayer in Birmingham or Jefferson County public schools because the politicians were so intent upon keeping the blacks out. They didn't even have time for prayer. Billy Graham came to Birmingham and he said, I will come to Birmingham if the clergy of this city can guarantee me a totally integrated Legion field. That was the big football stadium that held about 70,000 people. And I'll never forget my father, my mother, and I going down and sitting next to some African Americans and worshiping in a stadium that was only about a quarter field. And you have, and you have to understand where Martin Luther King Jr. was coming from in addressing those clergy, those those Catholic ministers, and that Jewish rabbi in his letter to a Birmingham jail. So I, I certainly hope we can meet. I'd like to comment on my question you raised. There have been times in the history of this country when there has been deep devotion, personal devotion, life of prayer, combined with civic responsibility and efforts for social change. At the turn of the century, 1900s, up 1920, along in there, in a time that was generally wiped away as time of the social gospel, a bunch of liberals, this and that. The fact of the matter is they were the Albert Schweitzers of this country. They had deep, profound, spiritual life of prayer and meditation, and then spent their days working in behalf of those who were underserved, underprivileged, neglected, and marginalized. And what prompted the joining of devotional religious faith, personal faith, and social engagement was a time when its attention moved away from doctrines and regulations and regula regulations of churches and legalism and moved to the person of Jesus. Wherever the person of Jesus has returned to center stage in the history of the church, and I know this is only one of the religions in this country, but whenever the person of Jesus moves center, center stage, you've had the union of uh, personal devotion and social responsibility. 
But it's different now. People say, well, we're trying to get rid of this. We're trying to take care of that. It's a far cry when you start saying, we're going to pass a law against it. We're going to pass a law. We're going to pass a law. This law and order stuff is beginning to get to me. I don't believe in adultery, but I don't believe in passing a law against adultery. Why does everything have to have a law against it? In taking away my free exercise of religion, when I don't get to think about it, all I have to do is say, well, it's the law, it's the law, it's the law. Things to me, it seems to me, things like mandatory sentence and zero tolerance and we'll pass a law is taking away the struggle, the responsibility, the application of my faith to my life and to my neighbors. Well, it's all settled. Even the role of a judge is robbed of its power because there's a law. What's the judge going to do? The book says that'll be six years. If you do that, you go for six years. What's the judge do? It's hard work putting on the road. The power of discernment and reflection and deciding and struggling with something is taken away. But in that period of time, and it comes up once in a while in this country, when the person of Jesus comes center stage to the life of the church, personal devotion and faith and social engagement have a marriage usually doesn't last long, it falls apart. Some are called liberal, some are called conservative, and group very cold. But it happens once in a while. Just once in a while. Jefferson, when he was asked, was he a Christian, said, yes, <clears throat> I follow the teachings of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And for him, that's what Christian meant. Yeah. He also thought the first great corrupter of Jesus was the Apostle Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Well, people always said he could beware of the disciples. It's interesting to me. I think I think the uh, the figure of Abraham Lincoln as the integration of belief and social responsibility is really extraordinary in the history of this country. He never was, as far as I know, a member of a church. He, he could find a church that said the only requirement for membership is. Love God with all your heart, neighbor as yourself, I will join it. But we've never had a president before or since that knew the Bible as well, nor brought it to bear upon his speeches and his life. It just, um, well, he represents in himself a lot that we, we need to recover, it seems to me. The happy marriage between personal faith and social engagement. Question? Yeah, I, I'm all for that, <laughs> what you just said. But I think that this discussion has been limited to Christianity more than I'm comfortable with when the topic is religion. Generally, I think people have various spiritual backgrounds and, and that are valid in this discussion. So I'd like to hear more of, of that. You know, that's quite true, and I think uh, I've tried to recognize the fact that I was just speaking of, from one religious viewpoint. I've been trying to understand, for instance, the social engagement of a Muslim, not a radical one way or another, but a Muslim. And I was interested in the expression, if you see an injustice, stop it. If you can't stop it, speak out against it. If you can't speak out against it, at least detest it in your heart. A Muslim statement, very strong, very strong. But how come in the Muslim countries the women have no liberty or rights? I'm thinking of Saudi Arabia. They can't even drive a car. They can't walk down the street without a compliment. Uh, it's got to be a member of the, a male member of their own family. They can't get on with a non-attached male. Yeah, well, so, I'm, not, I'm not commending the practice of the Muslim. I'm saying they have within their writings. Yeah, but apparently they don't put it in the private room. Well, <laughs> we've, we've, got to, we've, got to, we've got to remember in this country, my mother rode a horse five miles to vote when this country said,
said, okay, Mrs. Craddock, we're going to let the women vote. How long did that take? That was 1920, wasn't it? Yes. 1920. And you know for whom she voted? Uh, if she, I should say that she voted for Norman Thomas. Uh, and I said, Mama, you were a socialist. Whenever anybody tried to combine faith with social activity, they were called socialists. I said, Mama, you were a socialist? She said, I don't even know what that is. But I do know that somebody needs to care for those who cannot care for themselves. And that's the way she voted. That was 1920. Uh, we haven't always been quick on the trigger in this country of applying what we know or what's embedded in our Constitution and Declaration of Independence. It took an amendment to let the women in, took an amendment to let other races in. Uh, we shouldn't glamorize all that wonderful beginning. <laughs> The most efficient form of government in the world is a dictatorship, and I'm glad we're not that efficient. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I read something not too long ago, and it made a big impression on me because I, when I read it, I realized that I know a whole lot of people that feel exactly this way. And it was by someone who was conflicted, um, and she said, that she really had some concerns about the direction the country was taking, that the poor were getting poorer, and a great number of things. But, quote, if you're a Christian, you vote Republican. And I don't think people would have said that 25 years ago. And I think the churches bear some responsibility for that. I'll be in. Why? Because they had to be in order to win. 
I'm happy to, to tell you that I have heard from Governor Sanders, who, who is the bright star, in my judgment, in the galaxy of Georgia governors, has agreed to come up. As I told you earlier, uh, he's had some family problems, a death in the family that has sort of slowed him down. He's agreed to come up in, in October, and, and I am just looking forward to having him here because he, of all people, can best explain to you the transformation of Georgia from, a, from a, I'll say, backward state into the greatest state in the South during the four years that he served as governor. A lot of that came out of Senate Bill 180, is his moves on education. Yes. And, and also uh, <coughs> reinforcement and the demise of the county union system. Yes, sir. Isn't the first rule of politics get elected? That's do right. anything you have to do to get elected? Say anything you do, no matter what you believe. Unfortunately, you that's true. Yeah. Do what you have to do. And it's after that, you, you can do anything do. you want. Uh, going back to history, uh, certain states did have a state religion. Did Georgia ever have a state religion? Yes. Church of England. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Church of England. It was a church of England, and it was an, an official. Yes, their ministers were supported by the state and so forth. And what time frame was that? Prior to the revolution. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, it, it had to be sometime after 1732 when the charter was issued. But, uh -huh. but we, we didn't have a long time uh, before the revolution. But when you were reading, uh, one of you were reading that it was 23 state constitutions start out with uh, with God in the Almighty God or a term like that. Yes, uh, and I, I, I just picked uh, 23. I was going to do the whole 50. Just didn't have enough time. And in the preamble <coughs> or the first article of the deal has anything at all uh, to do with rights of man is uh, some sort of a tipping of the hat to Almighty God. But but that God, and, and, and that God is a generic God when it is. Well, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying he's a man. But somehow, God <laughs> has become, uh, lately, God has become uh, a God, when you say God, you're almost saying Christian along with it, you know. Uh, and, and that's a very troubling thing when we try to box God in with, with one a uh, particular religion or one uh, particular denomination within that or one particular way. That may be the Thank case you. for, for uh, some people, it isn't the case for me. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's just the name, the term, God. Uh, all of them would be appropriate too. Mm -hmm. Because okay. all of, in the in the, uh, in the Arabic Christian Bible, God is always referred to as Allah. Uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam all worship the very same God. I've got a question pending in here to break. Uh, quoting Karl Marx as saying religion is the ultimate of the masses. Uh, do the powers that be, political powers that be, use religion? religion to control the masses. <laughs> well, in the, in the union of, of church and state, uh, when the king is also the head of the church and this and that, the, the exercise of power in oppressing people, there's no question about it. And in the case of Karl Marx, uh, his parents, he's Jewish, tree of Germany, his parents were forced to be baptized so they could get a job. <coughs> now that boy grew up hating religion, hating Christianity, and I couldn't understand why. In order to get a job, go get baptized, then we'll take your application. Now that kind of environment produces statements like that that have a measure, had, had truth to them, not as much today. I, I, I am bothered by uh, the movement of religion into politics so that I am 
judged on the basis of what law I would support, not what I believe. For instance, I mentioned adultery. I'm not in favor of adultery, disrupting marriages and families and this and that, but I don't favor passing a law against adultery. So we're in a climate today in which the person who favors passing a law against something is considered religious and Christian. The person who doesn't favor passing the law, oh, you're one of those uh, pinkos or liberals uh, or whatever. I had a fellow in church a couple of Sundays ago asked me about passing a law against something. I said, why does everything have to be a law? Don't we have churches? and homes and teachers and Christian instruction? Why does it have to be made a law? Oh, I see you're liberal on this. I didn't I'm as opposed to what you're talking about as anybody else. But I think it needs to be a law. Uh, why not just observe it, teach my children, uh, have it taught in the church? I think, it's a, I think it's an indictment of institutions of religion that we're relying more and more on legalities to try to keep some moral core in our country. That's, a, that's an indictment on our failure to permeate the 11 in the law, which is a, what we're supposed to do. I've seen token, though, you can see the natural reluctance on the part of some people who are, quote, religious to begin to put themselves in the political debate for fear of being called yeah. a right wing, yeah. Yeah. conservative, or whatever. <coughs> it's a terribly unfortunate thing. But in the original days uh, of the Constitution, uh, they said that there are two <laughs> things that would support our country, personal virtue and religion. Mm -hmm. And that when one of those left, our government would collapse. I wanted to say something about using religion to control the masses. Um, one institution that was thoroughly integrated during uh, antebellum times were your churches. Although the blacks were confined either to the balcony or to the rear of the church, there was nothing more dangerous to a white man than a well-educated black minister. And uh, most masters realize that and encourage, you know, worship within the white churches to hear the white minister talk about Moses and the Ten Commandments rather than going off into the black churches where the black educated minister would talk about Moses, the deliverer of his people from slavery. So I think you've got to bear in mind that religion certainly uh, throughout history has been used as a way of, of controlling the masses. Uh, your anti-assembly laws that, 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 you know, that were passed uh, are indicative of this. Uh, so uh, definitely, in, in your question, religion is definitely a means of controlling the masses. I wouldn't call it an opiate. <coughs> But it's it's a control. <laughs> Some Americans strongly oppose giving broad based funding to churches and other religious groups. They believe that faith based initiatives violate the separation of church and state, Dr. Hale, in various ways. You believe these federal partnerships with religious organizations violates the establishment. Well, let me avoid the question and the, the answer by saying, <laughs> first of all, uh, there's always uh, a minister at the inauguration. The House and the Senate both have chaplains whose salaries are paid. Uh, the uh, opening of every session in October and subsequent session during the year of the Supreme Court in, involves a, a statement calling upon God not Catholic, Protestant, this, that, and other God, the, the generic God, or whatever you want to call it. So um, uh, God is in there so much, and religion is a, a part of our, a part of our uh, culture. <coughs> Repeat the 
last part one more time. I mean, I think I asked if you believe that these yeah, the partnerships, that was it, excuse me. If partnerships uh, are not predominantly, um, and by that I mean significantly, religious, uh, I, I see no wrong. And neither does Justice, Supreme Court Justice Kennedy, uh, who, who uses that as one of his points uh, to uh, supposedly to approach uh, an analysis of issues before the court. But if it is predominantly to uh, its one denomination or one religion uh, in a preferential uh, position, then he would, they would not be. Uh, he would not be in favor of it. So if it is. If the local church wants to have a soup kitchen, operate a soup kitchen or a thrift store with clothing donations and all to benefit the poor, and somewhere along the line they get some funds from some federal source, um, I see nothing wrong with it, provided their primary purpose and predominant purpose is to help the people, not to advance the religion or the denomination. I don't know whether you're aware of this or not, but you just described the Craddock Center. Did I? Okay. Exactly what the Craddock Center does. And I would not hesitate personally uh, to endorse federal assistance for the Craddock Center. Well, that be a reason. Why? Because nobody else does it. Right. You go nobody else does it. You know that the Craddock Center operates Head Start program in all of these counties here. That's not, that's not the responsibility of that organization. That's the responsibility of the government. So I think that uh, the that, that Craddock is to be commended for the fine work that he does and that, that his uh, that charity does. Now we've, we've uh, over the years, uh, been plagued by this over, this over concern, a realistic, but I think an overzealous concern about the federal government coming in and taking over. Uh, I remember uh, when I began teaching, uh, the big issue then was federal aid to education in any form whatsoever. And at that time, uh, apparently about the only federal aid to education was uh, West Point and Annapolis. And look how far we've gone and look how much good has come about as a result of the federal aid to education. Uh, who was it said that We've met the enemy and he is us. If there's something wrong with the federal government, there's something wrong with us. It's hard to need to step in there and get active. That was Paul Gold in the uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't read that such a way. Holmes. <laughs> Did I see a question? Yes. Um, I had a question on the earlier question. <laughs> um, uh, Dr. Craddock was discussing the uh, passing of laws, which Dr. Craddock was discussing the passage of laws which um, seem to be uh, religious in their intent rather than more, more than he would like. And, um, and I'm, I was just wondering if, if you all thought that this might be uh, perhaps uh, a, a sign of a new intolerance. Uh, and which we were talking about at the very beginning is what our country was trying to get away from when we established the country. And is this now a resurgence of that type of intolerance? What, what do each of you think? Ecclesiastes you said something about, I think, there's nothing more <coughs> under the sun. Uh, I've heard that line on so many different issues as I've grown up. But I, I just, I'm not sure it's new. I think we've had it, that sort of thing all along. The attempt to keep people from using alcohol mm -hmm. uh, failed, one of the biggest failures in this country. Uh, we were talking about some common ground. It occurred in the Clinton administration when, uh, and, and this perhaps Bobby addresses what you were talking about. Um, people from the conservative arena, the moderate arena, and the liberal arena all gathered behind President Bill Clinton as he signed <coughs> into law the right of the American Indian to use peyote for religious purposes. 
um, back during Prohibition, uh, wine continued to be produced uh, on the West Coast in California for religious purposes. And if wine was <coughs> okay to be produced during Prohibition, why should the Native American be denied his use of peyote in his own or her own religious service? And, and that was common ground. Conservative, liberal, moderate, all standing up behind President Clinton, supporting that. So I think there is common ground to be found outside of this traditional arena of, of Christianity as we have discussed it so far. I wish we could get away from the time when we start characterizing people as left, right, conservative, moderate, middle, or whatever and all, because I think it's a matter of an issue. Uh, for years and years, Southern, you know, quote, conservative congressmen were very liberal on the soil bank program. And you can pick out an issue and somebody's liberal on that issue, but they're also very conservative or whatever on another issue. So, so as Richard Russell said, yeah. in bad times he was a liberal, in good times he was a conservative. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, I think we have an example of that in our own state with our United States senators. Uh, Senator Talmadge, for example, which looked upon as being a very conservative member of the Senate, yet he sponsored legislation that was extremely liberal. But he was very careful about it, and he did it in a way that did not hurt him politically. Yeah. If you would observe his career, after an election, he would go to Washington, and he would introduce bills like school lunch bills and, and very liberal bills that he got passed because he was secretary, I mean, he was chairman of the agriculture commission. But as he went more and more toward the election, he became more and more conservative. By the end, by the time that his term was ending, he was probably the most conservative person in the world. Why? Because he had to be in order to be reelected. So that's the way it goes. Well, does that bring up consideration of something that Dr. Craddock said early in the conversation, that some of the social changes that have occurred in this country have occurred not when the conservatives have been in political power, but uh, when the liberal mind was there, I think of, uh, we have Social Security and retirement rights and everything that Frank Roosevelt introduced. Lyndon Johnson came in with Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, those were certain social changes, and they were always considered socialistic changes in those days. But I think he hinted at it, and we, we have walked away from it since. But I think it's a good thing for the, maybe for the panel to consider why have we had to wait for a diminution of the conservative influence to get something good for the common people in this country? Well, that's a good question, and I'm sure the panel will be happy to answer it. But, but may I make this <laughs> I have concluded that we Americans live in four-year cycles. We live in four-year cycles. We're already wondering who's going to be the next president. When today we have problems that, that should be addressed by the present administration. I think it's our fault that we allow these things to happen because we forget the past and look only to the future and decide you know, whether or not we're going to vote for it. <coughs> it's Clinton or whomever uh, two years from now. And that will be the main topic of political discussion on the television, on Fox Channel, on CNN, between now and the election. For the next two years. For the next two years, you're coming here. Who's going to be the next president? That's, I think, is their own throat. But, good question. <laughs> good question. Good, good. Yeah. Well, I think, I think uh, the cycle, I hadn't thought about the four-year cycle, but I've thought about the swinging of the pendulum. <coughs> when I, uh, began to teach in seminaries in Oklahoma. The students wanted, were revolted against anything that was traditional or seemed to be conservative. Take out the pulpit and take out the pews. We'll sit on bean bag 
wear Nehru jackets and read a little bit from Mahara Krishna and uh, anything that was traditional that <clears throat> the students came with a petition not to teach certain courses because they were conservative. So during that Generation X, I guess it was called, sort of throw everything out, down to the high places, political, religious, so and so. Now swing back the other way, holding on to those. Uh, I, I don't know it's always the case. Maybe it is. You've thought more about this than I have as to what, who was in office at the time certain changes came about. Well, you and I grew up on, certainly in the Frank Roosevelt years. Yeah, that's right. And, and as, as, uh, I think he said, uh, a, a Republican, <coughs> Frank Roosevelt was a truly communist because of the changes he wanted to bring in. But you have to consider that, I don't want to get too deeply into this, but when Roosevelt came in, he followed a Herbert Hoover who didn't know what to do. And so he, he tried the triple A, and that was overruled by the Supreme Court. He tried the NRA and the National Recovery Administration. That was overruled by the Supreme Court. So, okay, on Monday morning, I'm going to try this, fellows. And finally, I think one of the great things that came out of his administration, and certainly not the, is this Social Security idea that once you get to 65, or it's going to be 67 or more, yeah, the money that you've been forced to save all your life to put into the savings, <coughs> and you, you now can enjoy the fruits of that. And again, uh, I, I mentioned Lyndon Johnson. I think Lyndon Johnson as an individual was a crook. He got a mistress of California and a mistress of Washington. And, but we, we have Medicare thanks to him. We have Medicaid and we have support for the impoverishedly poor people that we didn't have before. And what's the, the conservatives are not chipping against? Get rid of it, cut down the taxes. I think you missed the three in Texas. <laughs> I have one personal question. I was talking to someone over in Paris the other day, a parent, a children who was complaining that that they feel they're being overwhelmed by a changing culture in the school. They feel that uh, that they find themselves now in the struggle for the hearts and minds of their own children. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's a sad state of affairs. But I don't know that there's, uh, there's anything that, that can be done about it. Uh, unless there is some effort made on the part of the local public schools to represent the wishes of parents. Any of y'all have any thoughts on that? Could you be more specific? Yeah, I'll be happy to. Uh, when I was growing up, I was taught, and I taught my children, that we were a part of a Judeo-Christian culture, and that we we had a uh, we had a God, we had Jesus Christ, we were Christians. And in this country, we were allowed to worship as we pleased. I think they uh, grew up understanding that. And yet, today, those same children, were they in school, could not pray. state-sponsored prayer. What is a state-sponsored prayer? It establishes religion. Now here again we come back to the idea of, of determinism. And we've forgotten that in Europe you don't have public education. You have schools for those who've been born to rule and schools for those who've been born to serve. We don't have a universal public education. 
we have public education in this country because we believe every person counts. That is a basic Christian doctrine, that every person is of worth in the sight of God, and that has, has fueled the, the greatness of our nation. And so we have education for every person, and we support that. We, it's in every local community as a local school board that provides education for all the people. But it's being undermined today by people who want to take away and the, the aristocracy in this country is manipulating the masses to try to undermine public education so we can go back to a, a, a school system that is fueled by the ability of people to pay and to withdraw into the enclaves of privilege and to leave public education for whoever whoever's left behind. And I think we need to get over it. We need to support public education and stop being sold a bill of goods about God in the school. Every individual child can pray Amen. in public education. You can go to school and pray. Amen. And you, you just can't be told how to pray Amen. by the administration of that school. And that is clearly understood. In silence, and we ought to be able to understand that in this country. Did you say that there is no public education in Europe? Well, not in the, not in the sense we have in this country. Yes, sir, there is. Have you ever heard of an Aufenkrugel, a real school, a gymnasium? That's the entire German system of education. It's public. And up to a certain point, I believe it's well, four years, years, six the years, the years then they go into commercial education yeah. or business education. The heritage we came out of that when, when, when our Constitution... I don't, I don't mean to quibble, I just want to know if I heard you right. There are occasions of similarities. But I think we, we're undermining what is a great thing about our culture. That's a different we're issue, but I mean, there is public education throughout Europe. In fact, there's very little private education. Compared to this question. question. Yes, sir. Um, I would like to respectfully disagree with this gentleman who says that that we, our students have the privilege to pray. There is a moment of silence. My wife is a retired school teacher, and the administration would not back them up enough for them to be able to quieten down enough during that period of time to respect those who wanted to have that moment of silence. So we are not being, our administration is not backing up our instructors to provide them that are students that avenue that they would like to have. Question? It isn't really a question, but in my mind, I think that I am a Christian, but I do not see the need to have a prayer in school that everyone has to either be silent or say a prayer or anything else. To me, this is part of religion, and I think that as families, as people, we need to pay a little bit more attention to teaching our children within our religious churches and synagogues and all the rest of it. Amen. It is not a part of teaching school. School has enough to do with all the things that are necessary. Amen. And as long as they're manifest, they're not going to be silent. Prayer. R.S. Mine in the 1840s. In the 1840s. And Noah Webster up a little bit earlier. But all of a sudden it was, you know, and now, and so. See, the first public schools were open in the 1940s. And then it was universal? The okay. prayer was there? It grew. It grew, it grew as, as the public schools grew. I think we also are still in a period of shock in that uh, nationalities and ethnic groups that once we read about in the geography book and they live halfway around the world are our neighbors and are going to the same school. And the quarrels used to be, are you Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, Roman Catholic, whatever. Now, are you Muslim? Are you Buddhist? Are you this and that? And many Christians are caught up short in that they haven't had 
education in the church to know what they believe and the assumption the assumptions are all gone and it's a frightening time but we better get with it and learn how to say what we believe in the presence of somebody who knows what he or she believes otherwise we'll be put under the table Bob, also I want to say something. I think maybe you were talking about something like this. The failure of parents to teach sexual education to their children has been delegated now to the public school system. Yeah. Well, that's a pretty sad situation. When a parent cannot teach their children about sex education. Please, I want the schools to do it if the parents can't do it. But I mean, in the days, that is just unbelievable that parents cannot teach their children sex education. Well, the parents are not qualified to be parents. I, I agree with that in any case, certainly. Am I done? Yes. Uh, I almost forgot the question, but my question is, where does the Constitution call for the separation of church and state, or does it? And uh, what does it mean? Okay, I'll be more That's one for you. Amendment, uh, amendment one, uh, it shall not establish. It also it shall not prescribe. It will not interfere. It will not negate the, the uh, activities of religion. And I think we've had a little bit of uh, more concern or emphasis placed on the first part and not enough on the other. The expression, the expression, the wall of separation between church and state is from the letter of Thomas Jefferson to the Baptist, the Danbury Baptist. Baptist, 18, his answer came in 1802. He was elaborating on the meaning of what is the First Amendment and used the expression separation of church and state because the Baptists were afraid they weren't going to be allowed the freedoms. No, they were up in that tough knot part of the, you know, in Connecticut, where they brought a whole lot of Europe with them, and these Baptists wanted more freedom, or were afraid they weren't going to get enough freedom, and wrote to President Jefferson, newly elected. And he used the expression, separation of church and state. So the phrase itself is from his letter to the Danbury, Connecticut Baptist, 1802. Oh, to, uh, to reassure them that they were going to be swallowed up, that they would still have their turf, they would still have their particular population. Bob, is it not true that what we have read that fewer and fewer, a smaller and smaller percentage of our population is even going to church? Well, I think that's true, yes. So why, how are they going to get religiously educated uh, if, if we're all discussing this afternoon, if they're not exposed to that?
and does not say. It is appalling at how little education is devoted to that. And when people don't know how their government works, they can't change it. Bob, I know this group here will remember very little of what any of us have said. And that's why I've always thought about my classes as well. But here's another book that some of you might be interested in. Norman Cousins, remember him in the Saturday yeah. Review? Yeah. Magnificent book called In God We Trust, The Religious Beliefs and Ideas of the American Founding Fathers. This is an unbelievably good book. Well, while you're plugging, uh, <laughs> by the uh, author of Franklin and Winston, John Meekham, American Gospel, God, the Founding Fathers, and the Making of a Nation. It is an excellent book that is not philosophical. It is not, it does not try to take one side or the other. It just cuts to the quick. American Gospel, God, the Founding Fathers, and the Making of a Nation. John Meekham. Can I make an observation? Certainly. Sure. Observation coming both from uh, the group in front and also uh, from the audience. On a number of occasions, I've heard uh, people saying something that might be construed as being against the larger group um, with uh, regarding morality and so on. And in each case, the person started with, now I'm a Christian, but, yeah. and it's almost as though people are afraid to be thought of as anything else, having to defend oneself as being a good person, a Christian, and, and espousing a view that is not the norm, such as anybody can pray in school, you can pray all day long if you want to, just not necessarily with the group at a particular time, uh, or any of the other things that have been espoused. It's, um, you have to be a good Christian. And then you can say, well, maybe there's another way to look at something also. And, and that's what I'm hearing on both sides. But why do we, why do people have to defend themselves? It's the new intolerant. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, I'd like to plug a book.
private minutes of the Constitutional Convention that were kept, in a sense, illegally by James Madison. The whole thing was conducted in secrecy with armed guards at the doors and the windows. And at his death, his notes on who said what and why they did this and why they didn't do that uh, make for interesting. I won't say it's uh, fun reading, but it's interesting reading. <laughs> Thank you.